Grace and peace to you from him who was and is and is to come. And from the sevenfold spirit before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Our sermon text you just heard in our hymn set to music. The words of Jesus in John chapter 14, beginning with the 25th verse. I have told you these things while staying with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. The Gospel of our Lord. Dear friends, what does it mean to be in a spiritual church? Is that a good thing? There are a lot of ideas of what spiritual means. Allow Allow Google to take a swing. Spirituality is the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. So says Google. I think what a lot of people mean when they talk about being spiritual is the mindfulness of spirituality, sometimes being present in the moment, sometimes focusing on things that they can't see or feel. But everyone seems to have his or her own definition. It's interesting, a recent study taken, one of these multi-generational studies, it didn't include Gen Z, I was kind of disappointed, but it went from boomers to millennials. And the results, when it came to God and spiritual things, were, were a little sad. When it comes to those who don't know, don't care, and don't believe God exists, for millennials, People born in the mid-80s up until around 2000. We can remember 9-11, most of us. 43% don't know, don't care, don't believe God exists. Meanwhile, 57% call themselves Christian. They're nominally Christian. And yet 16% of this generation, less than half of boomers, think that they're going to heaven after they die, but not necessarily by faith alone in Jesus. So 16% believe it is by faith alone in Jesus. So that means 84% of millennials don't know that it's through Jesus alone that salvation comes. 26% of Gen X, by the way, if you're between the mid-60s and the mid-80s. And this is about half of the generations before it. So it's really rather striking to see what a spiritual generation looks like, especially when millennials are more likely to look at a horoscope and decide that's a good life-determining principle or see karma as a good reason to get even because what goes around comes around, I can be the agent of revenge. Is that a spiritual generation? Today God tells us, he reveals to us what it really means to be a spiritual church. Because Jesus tells us that he will literally send the Holy Spirit on the night that he's betrayed, the night before he's pinned to the cross, the night before he suffers for our sins. He he tells the apostles the content of John 13 through 17 and occupies a, a good chunk of the book of John, and of course, John 14 rests right in there as Jesus is having supper with his friends, and he's telling them he's going to make them spiritual because the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit on them. Talk about a good way to achieve a spiritual church. And so in our text, Jesus reveals to us how to achieve the spiritual church. I've summarized it with three points this morning. Look into the New Testament 
Seek peace outside of this world and gather around God's gospel. One trial a spiritual church has when it comes to spiritual matters is deciding whether we actually have spiritual words to go by. And it makes a lot of sense to ask that question even when you read passages like 2 Timothy 3.16 where we learn that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, confirmation, graduates. You, you know what that's like because you're not really graduates. You're still learning, aren't you? Anyone who's been confirmed here. Um, or when you hear Peter saying the same thing as Paul did in different words in 2 Peter chapter 1 where he says, no prophet ever spoke by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It still may bring up the question, well, at the time, the whole Bible wasn't written when Peter and Paul wrote this. John still had his gospel and a few more words to write, a revelation. So were they just talking about the Old Testament? And then the question can become, is the New Testament as inspired as they were saying the Old Testament was? But here, in what Jesus himself has said in John chapter 14, we have an answer. Because Jesus said he would, his Father would send the Holy Spirit to remind, every, remind his friends all the things that Jesus said. And not just some of the things. He doesn't say part of this, but he says all of the words that I have told you. The Holy Spirit is going to come and remind you. This is also a very spiritual passage because the Holy Spirit's involved regarding inspiration of Scripture. So that Jesus' friends would be writing these things down and we wouldn't have to wonder whether, well, part of it might be the Word of God or some of it isn't, or maybe only the important parts are possibly God's Word. But all the things that Jesus told them, the Holy Spirit would remind them of. They would be equipped with everything that the New Testament church needs to hear, and it would end up being what we call the New Testament. Not just the prophets, but also the apostles are inspired. Now, throughout time, even in the last century of Lutheranism in America, this concept of divine inspiration, that the Bible doesn't have errors because it's the Holy Spirit who actually gave the words and the concepts to the apostles to write, has been challenged. People have been challenging this. 70 or 80 years ago, there, there was a famous writer who talked about how maybe the Bible just contains the Word of God. You, you don't have to say as a Christian pastor that the Bible is the Word of God. You can get by with just saying it contains the Word of God. So we might say, well, what are you suggesting? That maybe there's some corners and spaces of the Bible that aren't God's Word? About 50 years or so ago in Lutheranism in America, the question came up whether um, we could differentiate between the Bible and the Word of God. Are they different things? More recently, maybe it's just the important things of the Bible that are the Word of God. But do you see what happens when we start playing that game? By the way, it's a game that people play with the Bible for hundreds of years now. What the scholars discover is after they find what's really important or what they think really the Holy Spirit inspired and the rest of the stuff they write out, they never agree. It's an impossible game to start playing because, as it turns out, people disagree on what's important in the Bible. Isn't that funny? When we start to say, well, these words are inspired word for word from the Holy Spirit, but these, these were really just assisted and approved by the Holy Spirit, we end up finding ourselves in trouble. So, brothers and sisters, thank God that you are in a church body that confesses that the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Now we don't have to wonder. Now we don't have to worry. Now we don't have to write things out. Now we don't have to go based on our feelings of how this passage spoke to us. The Bible is God's Word. We thank God for that. Um, because inside the Bible, it tells us things like Jesus says that we don't have to doubt. Like, seek peace outside of this world. According to today's reading, what is the first good that's possessed by those who love God and keep his word? 
those who are part of the New Testament church? What's the first good that we get to own as members of the church, as people who have faith? It's peace. We have peace. Notice how that doesn't align with a lot of people's idea of what comes from outside this world. I don't know if you've seen it online on your social media, but lately there's a big deal about, I don't know if FBI are releasing their records or CIA or other government agencies that there are UFOs, only we're calling them UAPs now, unidentified aerial phenomena, and then you see like a blurry sphere on a picture or video, and I still can't, you know, it doesn't put the nail in the coffin for me that that's aliens, but you know, maybe someone knows what they're talking about. I'm not sure if I'm just being distracted. But what does that do when something comes from outside of this world and people see it in the news and government agencies are talking about it seriously? I think it's the opposite of peace, don't you? My heart churns with a little bit of fear and, and questioning uncertainty to think that, oh, we're being visited and I don't know what their intentions are. But brothers and sisters, you can trust that this world has been visited already. And we know what his intentions are. His intentions were to go to the cross for our sins and to die on our behalf so that you and I might have peace that comes from outside of this world. Um, he mentions none of the other things that people usually regard as great. He says nothing about royal honor, nothing about celebrity status, nothing about wealth and riches, nothing about a great reputation, nothing about pleasure and enjoyment, nothing about being spared suffering or poverty or dishonor or death. Instead, Jesus expressly says, not as the world gives do I give to you. Far be it from Christ to promise the church things that the world values, earthly goods. See, then we'd be in trouble. But precisely because of the reason that Jesus is who he is, does the world treat us the way that we are treated? And do we get the benefits that Jesus seeks to offer us? And how so? It's a very spiritual thought by the word of the Holy Spirit who reminds us of everything Jesus has said. Look, he's done it today. He's reminded us what Jesus said. Not of this world do I give to you, but peace, my peace, I give to you. I, lo I love how he owns the peace, too. He doesn't say peace in general, generic peace, because you and I know how ceasefires go in this world, how peace resolutions take place, and then not too long, maybe decades, maybe days after a ceasefire, we see warfare again in the same place by the same people. But Jesus says, my peace, my peace that I give to you. And you don't have peace if you're still wondering and wrestling with the notion that maybe your sins aren't forgiven. Even those sins when you've attempted to look inside this world for peace, Jesus says no. Even though you've tried to have a first place something else that you've erected in your heart instead of me, those times of idolatry, those times of worry and fear that maybe we can be harmed in this world, maybe this world can strip us of our faith, can strip us of our Christ. Jesus says, no, your sins are forgiven. My peace I give to you. It's outside of this world. There's no verdict against the believing sinner, no condemnation now for you and me because Jesus says my peace I give to you and since only those who love Christ and keep his word belong to the Christian church it's made up of a host of people who are known only to God for only the Lord who knows the heart knows his own you and I can't see emotions we can't see for sure whether someone else's faith is Evidently their faith, whether it's true or whether it's just apparently faith. You and I can't see love. We can't see trust. We can't see these things in one another, per se. We'd have to look inside the heart. So even though the church is made up of visible people, it's actually an incredible, invisible body that God alone knows. And even though it spans the whole face of the earth, you and I could never know for sure who is in it. So we talk about the invisible holy church. But 
there is one sign that can make the location of the church unmistakable. And the Lord declares it, that sign today, in this text. He was going to become invisible in the lives of his disciples. They weren't going to see him anymore, but he would send the Holy Spirit to teach them everything and to remind them of all the words that he had spoken. So by the work of the Holy Spirit, something that would never be taken away from the church of Christ was his word. Wherever the gospel is preached, his church is there. Maybe not everybody, maybe not completely, with an imperfect faith, but wherever the word is preached, that's where you'll find his church. Wherever word and sacrament is distributed. Wherever people taste and see that the Lord is good because the gospel has been there, you know that's where his church is. Sure, some, some will doubt it, maybe many. Sure, those in the pews may not be the ones singing in heaven along with God's believers, but even though you and I can't see it, their invisible things are taking place. People are repenting. People are sorrowing over their sins. People are hearing God's forgiveness. And by the work of the Spirit, people are putting their trust in Jesus and Him alone. So we see what the name of Jesus is. It's not just a word that slips from our lips, but it's a whole body of teaching, the pure gospel, where God tells us what He's done for us and how much He loves us in Jesus Christ. And wherever that candle burns, there you will find a number, be it large or small, of God's own. So, just like you don't go looking for sprouts of wheat where you haven't sown wheat seeds, you don't go looking for the church where it can't be found. If there isn't word and sacrament, if there isn't God's gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ and the cross, don't expect to find the church. And all the more important it is for us to remind one another of these words of Jesus, and that's also the Holy Spirit speaking. All the more important for us to open up a devotional book throughout the week and see what God has to say, because you don't know how this Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. All the more important to love the fact that you're part of this great, invisible body of believers that God alone knows, because his Holy Spirit is there. And I challenge you to question whether that's spiritual. Because if the Holy Spirit's there, I think he's achieved his own spiritual church. In Jesus' name, amen.